Unplugged In. The world marks a sobering milestone, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. But with hate crimes on the rise, how far has the world really come from the dark days of the Holocaust? We're particularly focused on domestic terrorism, especially racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists. In the United States, the FBI declares racially motivated violence a threat to national security and compares white nationalist and neo-Nazi groups to Islamic State. Is it possible to eradicate hate and racism? Unplugged In, Lessons from Auschwitz. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. Recently, world leaders gathered in Poland to mark a solemn anniversary. It has been 75 years since the liberation of prisoners at the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz. It is estimated that more than 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust, and of that 6 million, more than 2 million of the murdered were executed at Auschwitz. Reporter Henry Ridgewell traveled to Poland to speak with one man who survived that death camp. Along with his photographs and letters, Stanislav Zalewski keeps his memories locked away, occasionally letting them out to share the horrors of the past. Zalewski was 18 when he was arrested for painting Polish resistance symbols on walls in Nazi-occupied Warsaw. After a brutal interrogation, he was imprisoned. About 37,000 of these prisoners were killed, and about 60,000 were taken from Paviak prison to concentration camps. I was among these 60,000. I was taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau on October 6, 1943. The procedure was as follows. Registration in Auschwitz-1 camp, which involved taking personal information, taking off all our civilian clothes, cutting off hair, shaving, tattooing, putting on prison-striped uniforms. We got only a cap, a shirt, a jacket, underwear, pants, and wooden clogs. Zalewski was tattooed with the number 156569. Guards referred to prisoners only by number. Many new arrivals were taken directly to the gas chambers. Stronger men and women were used as forced labor. If one of the prisoners did not look fit enough for further work, the SS pointed him out with a stick to the camp writer, who would write down the prisoner's number. Afterwards, these prisoners were called out and taken on foot to the crematorium. One day, lorries arrived at the barracks, and women were let out, ordered to strip naked, and they were loaded as though they were some commodity. These trucks were followed by a soldier on a motorbike as they moved toward the crematorium. I still remember today the screams of these women. The transportation lasted several hours until they emptied the barracks. Zalewski was imprisoned for his political activities. Most prisoners were Jews sent to Auschwitz to their deaths, the Nazis' so-called final solution to wipe out the Jewish race. Zalewski recalls Jewish prisoners arriving on trains wearing bands bearing the Star of David. One SS soldier ordered them in one long line, with him standing at the front of the line and leading them forward. They followed this one soldier with no signs of worry or anxiety. They were heading toward the crematorium, but only we were aware of this, not them. As Soviet soldiers began to approach from the east, the Nazis transferred hundreds of thousands of prisoners to other camps. Tens of thousands died on the journey. Zalewski was taken to the mauthausen Guzen camp in Austria. In May 1945, rumors spread of the Allied advance and German guards fled. On May 5th, American military vehicles arrived. Two American soldiers got off. One of them knew some Polish and shouted, you are free. It took me 78 days to get from Nuremberg to Warsaw. I arrived in Warsaw on July 22, 1945, wearing U.S. Army fatigues. Zalewski is president of the Polish Union of former political prisoners of Nazi prisons and concentration camps. 75 years on, he still struggles to reconcile what happened.
When I say the Lord's Prayer, there is a phrase, give us our daily bread and forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who have sinned against us, I face a dilemma at this point. Can I forgive those who had an inscription that read, God is with us on their belt buckles, who kill people with cold premeditation? I put my memories of Auschwitz into a box. I tied it with a string and threw it into the water, metaphorically speaking. I worked, I started a family, I have a son and grandchildren. When I visit the camp or when we are talking like we are today, I pull out this box, I present its contents to you, and afterwards I throw it back into the water. There are moments, however, when these memories break into my psyche, causing reflections and questions with no answers. The world has not learned the lesson of what had happened. The world has come full circle, so to speak. This history, this circularity, is powered by people who do not respect the dignity of another human being. Zalewski and 200 fellow survivors returned to the so-called Gates of Hell for the 75th anniversary of the camp's liberation last month, still determined to teach the world the lessons of Auschwitz. Henry Ridgewell joins us from London. Henry, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, tell me, what were your impressions or your thoughts interviewing Mr. Zalewski? I think the first impressions were his incredible recall and his lucidity about what happened 75 years ago. Mr. Zalewski is 94 years old. He's seen the full arc, really, of the, the latter half of 20th century history, from his early uh, days growing up in Warsaw to imprisonment under the Nazis throughout the Second World War in Auschwitz, as you heard there, and in other concentration camps run by the Nazis. His release after that and life under Soviet rule and more recently life in Poland as a member of the European Union and now renewed worries about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. So it was just remarkable to speak to a man who could describe his memories in such detail. What you heard there in that report was a fraction of what he spoke of when I met him in Warsaw. He spoke for two hours about his, his memories, uh, many of them very harrowing memories of Auschwitz and of his treatment and of the treatment of the other people, particularly the Jewish people, that he witnessed at Auschwitz. So uh, as a journalist, as somebody able to meet someone like that, it was a privilege and it's one of those unique experiences that I think I will certainly never forget and I hope in that report it conveys something of the, the value that people of this generation still hold and need to convey to the rest of the world. Henry, so much time has passed, 75 years has passed, and, you know, and I worry, and I suppose a lot of people worry that people will not, you know, will lose sight of, you know, what did happen and the lasting impact. Um, what did Europe do? What did the EU do? What did the nations do to commemorate this, to keep this alive? Well, there was that ceremony in Auschwitz and there were other ceremonies in several other European cities to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation and, of course, in Israel as well. Just to give you uh, an idea, I'm here in Golders Green, which is a, a, a suburb of London. This has a very large Jewish population and that population grew dramatically after the Second World War or during the Second World War as Jewish people fled uh, Nazi rule in Germany and across Europe. And that phenomena happened in countries across Europe. And there are Jewish communities dotted across the continent, of course. After the Second World War, many Jewish people did go to help set up the state of Israel. But there are still surviving Jewish communities thriving here in Europe. But as we've been discussing, many of them say that in the last decade, they have become more fearful. A recent survey of European Jewish communities suggested that 89% of Jewish people in countries in Europe felt that anti-Semitism has been on the rise. So while we commemorate these events and that uh, very important uh, 75th anniversary uh, there last month at Auschwitz, bringing this right up to date, there are fears that, as Mr. Zalewski said in that report, those lessons have not been learned. Henry, um, Auschwitz is in Poland, um, but uh, I am certainly curious what, if anything, Germany did specifically, whether Angela Merkel had you know, made any statements or any special you know, uh, acknowledgement of what happened. Germany is credited 
uh, across the world as being one country that has managed to atone for its sins during the Second World War, for the huge crimes against humanity that were carried out not only against the Jewish race, but against, of course, other populations as well. And we have had over the decades since the Second World War repeated apologies uh, from not only Chancellor Merkel, but from other German leaders in history. Of course, there was a famous moment when a German leader got down on his knees and apologized for Germany. Germany's conduct during the Second World War. Chancellor Merkel attended uh, the ceremonies to mark the 75th uh, anniversary of Auschwitz liberation as well, and she will be deeply involved in other events this year. Of course, the Auschwitz anniversary event just kicks off several events this year that will mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. We have the anniversary of the bombing of Dresden coming up. We have the anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima, victory in Europe Day, victory over Japan Day. So this is a very big year, and I think you will see uh, the German government and Chancellor Merkel at the centre of, of those events. Did Mr. Zelensky tell you how tough it was for him to go back to Auschwitz, and was that his first trip back? No, it wasn't his first trip back. He has made several trips back there, and he makes a point of uh, doing so and being as active as he can, despite being 94 years old, in educating younger generations especially. He does numerous school visits. He travels overseas on several occasions throughout the year. And I think he has managed to uh, process the scale of really of, of the history that he witnessed and the magnitude of those events that he witnessed, what he still struggles to overcome and what did bring tears to his eyes during that interview were the images that have stuck with him from his time at Auschwitz. He mentioned there the arrival of the Jewish prisoners with the Star of David on their hands, them arriving with their suitcases in hand, not knowing that they were being taken directly to the gas chambers. He spoke of the treatment of the women who were stripped naked and put on uh, uh, lorries to be taken to the crematoria. And numerous of those details that came out were so harrowing that it was difficult to put them on camera. One last one that sticks in the mind is that uh, when he was freed, many of the prisoners from the camp looted the local shops. They hadn't had much to eat for ages and they ate so much that their stomachs could not deal with it. They had been starved for years and the next day they died. It, it's minor details uh, like that that we don't hear about that I think really stick in his mind and the minds of viewers. Henry, thank you. Henry Ridgewell, VOA Europe correspondent. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. The videos and photographs of the Holocaust are horrific. Documenting and preserving the many items from that very dark period is vital, and it's also vital to preserve those haunting stories from those who survived the death camps. Gretchen Skidmore is the director of civic and defense initiatives at the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, D.C., and she joins us here in the studio. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. You know, it's just it's just unthinkable, isn't it? I mean, there, there are just no words. It's like when you go back and you look at these videos, it's really, it's hard to describe. It really is, and that's why we spend a lot of time really thinking about the complexities of the history. So you have to think about, it couldn't have been possible with just a few Nazi leaders. It really involved millions of people, some actively collaborating, some really just acquiescing to what was going on around them, but trying to understand that phenomenon, trying to understand how and why the Holocaust happened, think critically about it, 
think about the impact that the history of European anti-Semitism had on those events. It's really a, it's really a complex thing, and we're trying to help educators do that work um, in the classrooms every day. But are the classrooms really covering it? I mean, I always wonder if I go out to the street and say it's to you know, some, someone, you know, what, what's the Holocaust? You know, I always wonder you know, what answer I'm going to get. And, and of course, that, you know, when you go to the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, you just see the shoes. You know, it's, it's you know, the people who are executed. It's just unbelievable. And I think, I do think there is an interest in this subject. We just had a survey from the Claims Conference. Nine out of ten Americans surveyed said it's important for students, students to learn this in school. Now, teachers are up against some challenges, right? There are time limits. There's resource limits. So as a federal institution, our goal is to make sure they have accessible resources, that, that the framing is there for them, that teachers that might not have training in this have the opportunity to really understand it and, and introduce it to students in a way that they can grasp and that's relevant to them. Well, you know, as time marches on, I mean, I mean so many of us probably know someone or might know someone who uh, was released from a camp. We're, we're getting beyond that. Right. And that's what I worry about is that when family members are no longer around to sort of, you know, to remind others and for the, those others then to talk to it with other people, I worry about that 75 years. So we honor and remember the victims and survivors by encouraging people to study and understand this history. And history education, the Holocaust is always relevant, but I think right now it is particularly relevant. It's a study in human behavior and choices people make and how those choices matter today in their lives. All right. I don't mean to minimize in any way the Holocaust by asking this next question, but um, are there any parallels to the anti-Semitism today? Um, are, are we seeing, you know, more of a rise in it, um, you know, in, or even bigotry in other ways? So people have always, there's been a long history of hatred, a long history of people being susceptible to misinformation. I think what's changed is the presence and the amplification of this through social media. People are no longer isolated in this. They're in a community now, and that makes it socially acceptable. And so that means we have to meet those, meet those trends in society and in human nature. The, the rise of hatred and the ongoing you know, um, sort of presence of that in communities with awareness, the power of that in the past, and how we need to continue to work all across platforms in order to combat it today. And so social media is almost an accelerant. It is. It's an amplifier. Um, any thoughts on how to sort of reverse that, have an amplifier to do just the opposite? Well, we have a very active Instagram page, for example, Reach Youth Where They Are. That's where they go for information. That's where we post about history of anti-Semitism, the role it played in the Holocaust, key facts about understanding enough about that phenomenon to recognize it today and to be able to think critically. What am I seeing? What should I do about that? What's my range of responses on that? And we have to be where they're going. And so social media, other platforms, YouTube, other things that are on our website are an opportunity for people to engage in the facts of the history and how it can inform their understanding of today. You, you know, it's so horrible that when you see these videos, you think that this could possibly be in the sense that because it's just so it's so horrific, so evil. But I think that. You know, we, we can't change human nature, but we can respond and we can change how we set up structures that educate people to see the dangers when hatred is unchecked. And that's what we learned from the history of the Holocaust. Well, um, the, and, and let me say again, I don't, my next statement is not to minimize what happened to the Holocaust because it stands alone. Um, but, uh, you know, I tip my hat to the, to the museum because uh, the Holocaust Museum here in Washington is one of the few entities that has condemned as genocide what has happened to the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar as they got pushed out into Bangladesh. So when you look at early warning indicators in societies that help us not only respond once there have been group targeted violence, but also to get people to understand that we can look for these indicators and prevent some of these things, that's the mission of the museum. But it's interesting how, you know, we, everyone said never again, but yeah. we've had Rwanda and now we have this. I mean, there is sort of, a, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, looking the other way. But we can also recognize that there are structures that are possible to implement both in the United States government and a lot of the work of our centers at the museum are about engaging governments in setting up structures that recognize these things and respond early. You, you said to, to in, help, in terms of helping educators in questions of time, um, you said that this, the teachers don't have the time in the classroom? Sometimes they don't have time. Sometimes how can, you, how can you not have time for something that is so so important? Because it has so many branches in terms of well, history is important. We learn from past behavior, so we don't repeat behavior, so we can take appropriate action. There's a lot of um, 
a lot of pressure on teachers to cover a lot of subjects. And certainly there's a, an appropriate emphasis on STEM. There's things that, that must be covered, right? But we know that the history of the Holocaust, the history of Western civilization, the history of the world is being taught in a lot of different disciplines now. It may not just be the history classroom. It might be the English classroom. It might be civics. It might be, you know, sort of political science. It might be sociology.